We'd have our Harlem Speaks educational initiative. We'd have an exhibit. Just tonight, someone came up to me, another person, and an two people came up to offer collections of photographs and things like that. And I want a space where we can really use these things. Ta the, the very first person I met on that end was Taja years ago, who came in one day when we first opened up here and opened up this huge envelope with photographs going back to the turn of two centuries ago and the people that she knew. And so, you know, we did, and, and, and Delilah has offered stuff. And so we want a home for all that stuff. And so, again, please support us. Please bring more people to these events. Please make a donation if you can and uh, do whatever you can because this stuff uh, should never be taken for granted. But speak of not taken for granted, uh, Delilah Jackson is someone that we never want to take for granted. And I want to ask you about Black Patty and your foundation and all your... Business. Well, Black Patty, um, Cesaretta Jones was named Black Patty. She was a singer. And we didn't have opera singers in those days, so she had the Black Patty's troubadour, and she had her own singers. And Ida Forsyth said, you sang so loud, I don't care if you sounded good or not, because nobody could hear you, because every, everybody was singing real loud, you know, for opera. Mm -hmm. And uh, she had her own troubadours, and she would go in the South. And she also, she would tell the people in the South when she got by herself and had the, uh, or the term to herself, she would say, leave down south and come to New York. She said, I got some papers from the Chicago Defenders, and I have the uh, Amsterdam News, and I got all the papers. You're not doing nothing in the south. And everybody would want to leave. And so they got so they stopped the people from leaving the south. So some of the people would take their boss's wagon to the station and leave the wagon and come anyhow. So that was her way of getting the people up north. But she, uh, Ubi Blake said, it sounded like she had a canary in her throat. Her voice was so beautiful. Mm -hmm. But the only person I met who sounded like uh, Black Patty was Yvette Glover, mm -hmm. Savion Glover's mother. Mm -hmm. So at the, uh, when I did a show of Duke Ellington's at the Beacon Theater, I had the Cotton Club girls dancing, and I had some of the Bunny Briggs. And so she was on the show. And when she sang, everybody said, my God, Yvette, if you had a voice like that, why did you stop singing? Why did you let us know? She said, well, I had to get Savion out the way. And Savion is 12 now, she said, so now I'll, I'll go on my own. And so Reverend Gensler just said, my sermons is preach when Yvette is here. And he said, Delilah, she's a Mahalia Jackson and Dinah Washington. Mm -hmm. And so Kobe always has her at a birthday party, and she and Kobe's good friends, so she sings at all of Kobe's affair. But now, her son is uh, honoring Al Haywood, me, and some of the people that kept TAP alive, uh, May 25th, uh, Bill Robinson's birthday at the, uh, what is that? At? May 28th, isn't it? No, May 25th is uh, New Jersey. Um, it's at the. Uh, and Jay Pack? Yeah, that's it, yeah, so I feel honored. And Jay Pack in Newark, right? Because I remember when he was a little boy, he was a um, tap dance kid, and. He was always so manly. People would say, oh my God, this kid is wonderful. He'd look in your eyes and wait till you finish speaking and then start talking. Won't you have breakfast with me and my mother? He was just a lovely little kid. And now he's a man and he's so sweet. He's still a nice guy. Yeah, yeah. So let, let's talk about the, uh, 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 about the Black Patty uh, Foundation. I mean, is, is it a foundation? No, it's actually? a research project. It's a research project. Yeah. Tell us all about it because it's such a wonderful thing. Well, I was fortunate enough to. Uh, meet uh, the Cotton Club women. They all lived in uh, 270 uh, St. Nicholas Avenue, Hyacinth, and uh, Cleo Hayes, Marion Edgebird, and then Charles Cook. He had been one of the uh, Cook and Brown tap dancers. So I was able to, you know, they, they liked me, so they said, give her an interview. So I would interview them, and they would tell me about it. Those wasn't bad days at the Cotton Club, you know. We were able to get beautiful clothes, there was always a man coming around selling your hot clothes, but weren't really hot. <laughs> so we always had fur. We had fur, uh, fur wraps, and we had, and also they had uh, stage door Johnnies. We would, you know, bring them also things. So uh, Hyson stayed the whole ten years. She was there from uh, 27 to 1940, and then she went to Paris with the Cotton Club show with uh, Dizzy and those and Teddy Hill Band. You know, Teddy Hill was messed up because the one thing he did and the uh, union fired him and he lost his band, so he had Minton's Playhouse. 
Has Mittens reopened yet? I, I keep hearing no. that it's about to open. It. No, it Robert De Niro said he was going to open it. That was five years ago. No, no, but no, 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 but just recently they oh, really? uh, rebuilt the bar. I was by I there a couple of months ago. Mittens play. <laughs> but they redid it recently, but I don't know if it's actually opened the door yet. Does anybody know? Yeah. I can't imagine that it has because we know about it, right? Yeah, I think Earl Swain has it. That's right, Earl Swain. It's not open yet. It's not open yet. Okay. Well, we at the Amsterdam Music Association, we used, we used to go there and do shows, uh, uh, you know, when, when it was cool. But it, it used to seem bigger, but it's small, mm -hmm. you know. But people didn't know that Minton's was famous for the uh, jazz musicians, but they had dancers there. Mm -hmm. They had two uh, stu two stages. One was for the dancers. And they specialize as like Chinky Grimes was a shake dancer there. They had a lot of shake dancers doing mm -hmm. work there. There's someone who I, op I overheard a conversation during the break between you and one of your friends as I was coming through, and I heard the fascinating name came up, and I wonder if I could ask you about it, which is a female jazz trumpet player that I mean... Valeda Snow. Right. Okay. Valeda Snow. For, first of all, let's assume here that, 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 that there are some people who doesn't know who she was. Who was she, and then what do you know about her story? Well, Valeda Snow, uh, she started, uh, her and her sister, La Veda, and her brother named Alveda, hmm. and they started uh, in, the, um, what would you call it, Black Vaudeville, and yeah. they were about eight and ten, and their father took them all over doing shows and dancing and everything. But Valeda, she played trumpet, they called her Little Louis in Paris, because she played like, like Louis Armstrong. But Valeda, not only did she play trumpet, she tap danced, she played the cello, and when she got drunk, she played the piano. <laughs> she could, <laughs> because she couldn't play the, she couldn't hold, hold the trumpet up. But she was a, a beautiful woman. She wore beautiful clothes and everything. And then, uh, while she was at the Cotton Club, she fell in love with Ananias Berry, who was 19 and she was 30. And so she married uh, one of the Berry brothers. Tell us who... Again, who were the Berry Brothers for folks who don't know that name anymore? Oh, Ananias and Warren and James. Uh, they were the three tap dancers and great dancers. They were at, uh, at the Cotton Club in 1927 with Duke Ellington. And not only were they uh, tap dancers, they strut. They did the strut and they did the acrobats because um, Robert would hold, James would hold uh, Warren legs around his neck and he would tw twist him around. They were really great. And they would with all the Waterville shows, and they made movies. They made a lot of movies um, with um, Dan Daly and Betty Grable, You Are My Everything. So they were tops in, in their fields. But only thing, you know, I hate to bring this up, but when Dope came, Dope took a lot of the, I won't name the names, but it took about five young tap dancers I knew then. Mm -hmm. They died of uh, overdose. So Valida <laughs> Snow married one of the Barry Ananias. Brothers. Okay, Ananias now Barry. Valida Snow, if I'm not mistaken, I've read some things in books about Germany and Nazi spies. Oh yeah, being in a, a Valida was a big liar. She didn't. Uh, she said she went to Germany and uh, she was in a concentration camp. Sarah worked with uh, Valida at the Club Harlem. She, she knew Valida, and um, Peg Like Bates knew her also. You know, but you know she wanted to exaggerate because there were no black people in concentration camps. <laughs> they were, <laughs> they were in internment camps. I guess one good thing you could say about them. <laughs> <laughs> they were internment uh, camps. That was an uncomfortable joke, folks. I'll take it back. <laughs> I'm sorry if I offended anybody. But they, um, they had internment camps that would keep you in, you know, because Jack Butler, you know Jack Butler, the trumpet player? Sure, with the hair. Yeah. yeah. He called himself Jacques Butler when he came back to America. <laughs> and he said, I'm never going to, when he was in Paris, he said, I'm never going to leave Paris. Me and Sidney Bechet is best of friends, and we're going to stay here. But then he started hearing about rumors of war, and then he came back to uh, America. But I must tell you that uh, Jack Butler, he was a great uh, trumpet player, and he said Willie Bryant at the Apollo would have him and Ram, uh, Teddy Hill, Ben Webster get on the stage and all do the shim sham. Because, mm. see, Willie Bryant was a tap dancer, right. so he taught all of them to do it. Mm. And he said when they would go down south, people would tell Willie Bryant, why you want to stay with these black guys? Why don't you get a band by yourself? You're a white guy. And Willie Bryant said, no, I'm not, you know. <laughs> but he looked so white until um, the people down south. What did you know about, can, can, can you tell us about Ralph Cooper? Oh, he was a wonderful man, yeah. R Ralph Cooper was real good looking, you know. He lived uh, what he called the jungle in the 53rd. That's where Hal Crome and my mother's from. They called the jungle in the 50s. And he, he was so good looking. He was a tap dancer and he was in Running Wild. He introduced the Charleston. Too close. He introduced to Charleston and then he got him with Eddie Rector and they called it Rector and Cooper. 
and they danced at the plantation where Florence Mills was. <laughs> and so Ralph Cooper told me, Eddie Rector didn't need me. He said, but just that I was cute and looked nice in a white suit. But he said, Eddie Rector was the greatest dancer. Mm. But then Ralph Cooper got a lot of money and he got into films, The right. Duke is Wild and Gang Bus, Gang War, and he made all these films. And he had a band too. He went to um, Paris, Irving Mill, called the uh, uh, Irving Mill's uh, Blue Bonnet Band. He was the first one had it, mm. but then Irving Mills took it away from him and gave it to Lucky Milliner. So he mm. did have a band at one time. Mm -hmm. And th uh, May 20th, Colby's going to have me showing uh, the Blue Ribbon Band, Irving, Mil uh, Irving Miller, Blue Ribbon Band. Mm -hmm. That'll be at Colby's place, May 20th. And we have flyers about some of these things, right, folks? We have flyers, which we'll hand out at the back to tell you about Colby's place, which we talked about a couple of weeks ago. It's absolutely wonderful. Absolutely. But then Ralph Cooper was at the Apollo the whole time they had shows at the Apollo. And I was telling uh, how that Ralph Cooper and Mr. Schiffman hardly spoke. But he said, I'll stay there for my people. Because he left the Lafayette Theater. He was a, a working. close to Adams. He was working at the Lafayette Theater. Yes. And he left the Lafayette Theater, him and uh, Clarence Robinson. And they said, we're going to go to the new show, The Apollo. Mm -hmm. And you know, uh, uh, one of the little dances at the uh, Lafayette was Sammy Davis' mother, Baby Sanchez. Baby Sanchez, that's Sammy Davis' mother, uh, Elvira Davis. Her sister was named Julia Sanchez, and she worked as a chorus girl at the Lafayette. And she said, can I bring my little sister? And so uh, Leonard Harper said, well, how old is your little sister? He said, she said, 17. He said, OK, bring her. She can get, get in the chorus line. And so when she got to the, uh, left the Lafayette, then she went to the Apollo. And then she got into a show called Holiday and Dixie. And then she fell in love with Sammy Davis uh, Sr. She said, oh, he was the handsomest man I've ever seen, tall, dark, and handsome. She said, my mother said you're going to fall in love with somebody. But she said, I got married. And then I had <laughs> Sammy. And uh, pick mm -hmm. me just to hold Sammy so she can go and tap dance. And so she would go and tap dance. And then Sammy got so excited. He wanted them to make him up like a, you know, a clown and everything. And so he was like pig meat, like uh, uh, he was little 18 months, so he would jump on the stage and dance. Mm -hmm. but, but she said when she went to the Apollo and Sammy Davis was a star, she told him, I was a star before you. Mm -hmm. And Sammy Davis said, that's true, because when I got there, everybody said, that's baby Sanchez's mother. Don't take advantage of her, because they had all kind of tricks at the Apollo. And they said, Treat him nice. That's Sammy Davis. And then he was so happy at the Apollo. And uh, Mr. Shipman would say, I knew her when she was 17. And baby said, but he wasn't nice to me. <laughs> mm -hmm. <laughs> let's, let's switch mics. Because this one is a little bit louder. I mean, OK. So many names and so many things I want to ask you about. How, here's two. Just, just what's one? Is it OK? A lot of people don't know who Big Me was. Well, I was, I was just about to follow up on that. Thanks. Now, most people remember from later years, you know, here come the judge and all that kind of stuff. But that, that was Pigmeat's thing, right? Yeah, but you know, Pigmeat said that um, it was Sammy Davis that did that in laughing, saying, here comes the judge. Here comes the judge. But Hal Cromer said there was really a black judge like that, but say, here, you know, act all hip and here comes the judge. Here comes the judge. Mm -hmm. And that was his, uh, his beat. And so Sammy Davis wanted to help Pigmeat. And so Pigmeat got famous for Here Come the Judge. And Apollo couldn't afford him, you know. He was getting like $3,000 $3, a week. But he said, I wish I could help Tim Moore and Spryder Bruce and all those old comedians that didn't make it, but I made it, you know. But mm -hmm. he was real funny. He said he invented the trucking, the dance, you know. That was, that was his dance. Mm -hmm. Did you ever meet or hear much about Dusty Fletcher? No, I heard about him. Yeah, he, uh, I, I didn't know about him. They said he did Open the Door, Richard. Yeah. And, but so they said that made... Everybody was doing Open the Door, Richard. Even Frank Sinatra, everybody had that at right. Open the Door, Richard. You know what's so funny? I just had a, a blazing insight here, which is that, not that this is wrong. This is very good. This is, this is wonderful. But you know what would be even better, and, and, and we're going to have to do this, we're going to have to get together and have a panel discussion mm -hmm. with you moderating, yeah. not oh me, yeah. with you moderating with all these people here, because I'm just having this feeling, not of a lost opportunity, but because we're all here tonight, but if, if we're, we're going to do this again. And we're going to gather in a different formation okay. and have a whole day. And my friend here, Ruth Guzman, right. she's one of those legendary barmaids I was talking about before. <laughs> and she worked at Small's Paradise. And she would said, she told me the other day that uh, one of the men was got, getting out of character. And those days, Bumpy was the biggest gangster in Harlem. And she said he would tell people, even Al Capone had class. 
<laughs> and so she was one of those women that people would come and talk to because she's still sociable and personable. And they would come and talk. I'm going to go to see Ruth, um, Ruth, uh, Guz Ruth Guzman. But she knew Tondalea. Tondalea lived in her house. Mm. And I, always ha I got Tondalea out of retirement. She would do my shows at Museum of Natural History and Marion Egbert and Vivian Brown and Juanita Basso. And the wonderful Al Haywood, when we did the first tap dance show, he picked them all up in a limousine. And once they got on the stage in Juanita Basso, they tore up that stage. I mean, even though those women are in the 70 and 80, but they could still tap dance. Mm -hmm. And they felt, oh, they felt like a queen. And Estralita, that Al Haywood is picking them up to do a tap dance show. Mm -hmm. The beautiful Estralita, Estralita was ape and Estralita. <laughs> <laughs> ape Estralita. <laughs> oh, man. Well, I love to sit and have a conversation with everybody. So we're going to do this real soon. We're going to talk after the thing. We're going to put together a panel. We're going to have a whole day about this because you, you, you were just... Uh... Wasn't Valeda Snow's sister a bomb maid, Valeda Snow? Valeda Snow's sister. I heard she was a bomb maid also. And Laura Watson, oh, Laura, she, wow. yeah, she, I did a show called uh, Duke Ellington and Ladies, and I had uh, Laura Watson, and Kobe would have her at her shows. Yes. And one thing wonderful about Kobe, she would give memorials for these women at the uh, Jazz Church, uh, Chinky Grimes and Laura Watson. But it's just so bad that people, old people didn't come out at night, so there weren't many people there. Mm -hmm. But she would remember Laura Watson, because Laura Watson had a great voice. Oh, yes, yeah, she did. Yes, yeah, she did. Yes, yeah, she did. Uh, let me, I, I don't even know where to start with all these people and names that you mentioned. How about two different things I'll throw together and just see what, <laughs> what comes out. Um, one would be someone who was very well known, but but not for her, her early work, which was the great Ethel Waters. And yeah. the second would be, tell us about, about Buck and Bubbles. Oh, my, he was my friend. But you know, I'm working on a, helping a book now called Stormy Waters, Stormy Waters, uh, about <laughs> Ethel Waters, you know. She would say that um, she started when she was about 13, she had gotten raped, and uh, they just treated her so bad. She lived in Philadelphia, and then she came and worked for the Black Swan Black Record Company, right. and she worked with Fletcher Henderson, uh, the, on the Black Swan Record Company. Pace and Handy, right? Yeah, Pace and Handy. Yeah, but first was Pace and Handy. And then she said that the two people that worked there was Freddie Washington and Isabel Washington. Their father was one of the messengers. And, they, and she made her first recording. But you know, Ethel Waters, uh, when she started singing, <laughs> Bessie Smith, they wouldn't listen to Bessie Smith because they said she's not that refined. Because mm -hmm. Ethel Waters said, I can't give you anything but love, baby. And so Ethel Waters was selling all, all the records. But Ethel Waters' real fame was um, Stormy Weather. Mm -hmm. And Harold Allen wrote that for Cab Calloway. That was going to be another Minnie the Moocher. But then they said, no, this is not a man's song. Uh, this is uh, Ethel Waters. You know, we, want, we want her to sing it. But at the Cotton Club, people don't know, the Cotton Club would have choirs back on her. They had great, um, a great orchestra beside Duke Ellington. They have a, a side orchestra. I, but then I, Ethel Waters. She became a big, great actress. You know, she did Member of the Wedding, and she did Flash and Fury. And Mamba's Daughters. Mamba's Daughter, Ma yeah. Mamba's Al Daughter. Alberta Hunter Cabin told me. This guy. Said, Al uh, Alberta Hunter was in uh, Ma uh, Mamba's Daughter. She said, Ethel Waters threw everything me but the kitchen sink. <laughs> you know, she was hard on her. You know, she was hard on people that work with her. But she said that those um, dance director like Edmonds, she worked on Fifth Avenue, Edmund Connors. And she said, working there was one step from domestic. It was so sad. You know, there's, there's a wonderful book. I, I hope it's still in print, but Ethel Waters' book, His Eyes on the Sparrow. Oh, it's still, it's still in print. And that's a book. If you don't have that book, go out and buy that first thing in the morning, because that's one of the great books. But you know, she now. told everything in that book. I mean, she, she was frank. She was very honest. That's, that, that's why it. I like it so much. Yeah. But uh, people were sad when she uh, worked for... Billy Graham? Yeah, they didn't like that, you know. But she well, see, that's that, that's on my generation. That's how we got to know Ethel Waters, was this big lady who was out there, you know, with the evangelist thing and her voice. Went, and then later on, you begin to find out that yeah, before yeah. Louis Armstrong, she was swinging and on records, and she was this great actress and all this stuff. And but I work, I uh, helped Brick Top. You know, there was a woman oh, who was, top. yeah, she lived on. Uh, I'm going to interrupt again and ask you to explain to folks who might be listening. You mentioned these names, and we know them Ada Smith, Brick Top. You know her but, name is Ada Smith. But, 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 but tell people who don't know, who was Bricktop? What did she do? Why was she important? 
Well, Brick Top, she said she first worked at Connie's Inn. She, she was like a chorus girl there. But she worked at uh, Barron's. At that time, it was on 34th Street. Uh, Baron Wilkins had a club, a black club. And she said while she was there, she had known Duke in Washington, you know. And he was just a young fella. And Sam Woodings was the band, right. the big band at, uh, at Barron's. And so Duke and um, Sonny Greer and what was that one? Toby Hardwick. Yeah, Toby Hardwick. They was going to give up. And she said, no, I'm going to get Barron to fire the band and hire you. Mm -hmm. And so that's what happened. But um, Jean Bach said when she would have the band at her uh, place and Big Top would be there, she'd be bossing Duke around. I don't like the way the band came in. She act like, you know, she's still a, you let those men take advantage of you. They were coming in late and they look all. <laughs> so since she had got Duke that job, she act like she could boss him, you know. Because <laughs> Jean Bach was a, Duke Ellington, I think, was in love with her when he was, you know, when she was really young and he would, call her all the time and she stayed his friend and Jean is so funny she would say she'd fall for his job and she said Duke I think you should do that tune a little more like this and he said like, yeah I'm gonna do it but she said she knew he wasn't paying no mind <laughs> but um, I must tell you this Ruth Ellington is a wonderful woman I mean she let that hair down and it was blonde you think that you know cause she, she, and she wanted that blonde long hair but when I was with the Negro Actors Guild every place I would go to they said Ruth has already been here and she saw about Brick Top every day of her life. She went to see about Brick Top, how Brick Top was. And all Duke, Duke would put down the women after he'd fall in love with them, you know. Mm -hmm. And she'd stay friends with them and try to get them nursing homes. And I don't think Duke Ellington liked old people because he didn't bother with the, when the women got old. <laughs> he didn't bother going to see them and everything. But he was still a wonderful man. I'm too young to have a white haired son. Look at that man there with right. white hair. <laughs> but Mercer wouldn't dye the hair. Right, he, right. He, he kept the hair uh, white like that. But you know, Duke, until the last days, he was ready to go back on the road, you know, because he told Mercer, you're going to take the van out now. He always worked so hard because he paid Johnny and all them uh, a, a lot of money, though. That's Johnny Hodges, yeah. one of the famous saxophone players in the band. Yeah, absolutely. But um, getting back to Bricktop, so Bricktop had worked at Connie's Inn, and she worked at Barron's. She was singing. And there was a white woman called Brick Top, so Connie Enneman named her uh, Brick Top. She was a great entertainer, because when I was helping her, she would get up and tap dance for me and show me different steps. And she just would say, you know, Ethel Waters, we were on Vaudeville together, and Ethel Waters was called Mama String Beans. And she said, Ethel Waters used to run and do the running slide. You don't see that mm. no more. So she mm. said, Ethel Waters was beautiful. So Brick Top went to Paris. And she opened a club called Brick Top there with Cole Porters and Duke and Duchess of Windsor and all the people, Gloria Swanson, everybody came to her club. And at that time, Jimmy Monroe, who I like very much, people don't like, <laughs> he was uh, Billy Holiday's first husband. And so Jimmy Monroe, he had a club called Club Harlem in Paris too. And so she said, I would take all the women, the men rather, to Club Harlem, but I wouldn't take the women because I know Jimmy Monroe would jive them and try to take their money. But I like Jimmy Monroe. He was um, Clark Monroe's brother. Clark Monroe had the Uptown House yeah. and Spotlight Cafe, a jazz club. Mm -hmm. And Dizzy told me that was his first place where he worked. He said a lot of us got jobs at mm -hmm. the Spotlight Club and um, with um, Clark Monroe and Jimmy Monroe. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. How about just real quick, we just mentioned the names the, uh, about Buck and Bubbles. Oh, John Bubbles is wonderful. <laughs> He was so talented. He was a great dancer and singer and how he strutted. When they wanted Cab Calloway, they wrote Sporting Life for Cab Calloway. But Cab Calloway, was, oh, he was going to go to Paris and talk French and jive the girls. He was going to go to Paris. So he wouldn't take the uh, George Gershwin role of, of Sporting Life. So they gave it to uh, Bubbles. So Bubbles plays uh, Sporting Life. And he did A Necessary So and all those great things. And he also did. Um, he tapped beautifully, because Honey Cole said he tapped on his toes, and he was one everybody uh, followed. He was a very handsome man. You've seen him in Cabin in the Sky when mm -hmm. he's working with, with Ethel Waters. Yes. <coughs> and Buck was a, a wonderful pianist, right? Yeah, Buck Crawford, yeah. yeah Buck Washington. Buck Washington. But you know, he did um, things for Bessie Smith. He did background, because mm -hmm. he was the one that helped um, Bubbles. He was a great entertainer without Bubbles. Mm -hmm. But Bubbles, when, when he would do different shows, he would always have uh, uh, Bubbles with, uh, Buck with him. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. But then Buck, uh, Bubbles got paralyzed, uh, couldn't walk. 
And then when Black Broadway came, George Wien hired him to be in uh, Black Broadway, and he did uh, uh, Ain't Necessary So. And he told me, I never thought I'd be back on Broadway. But Joyce Wien and George treated him so beautiful. Bobby Short also had a big hand in that show. I forgot about that. It was his show, really, That's wasn't it? That's right. It was his idea. Right, it was his idea. Right. And he was in it, too, before he went to work. You know, he would do an early show. He would do, like, um, things from um, early black Broadway. That was a wonderful man, Bobby Short. Gene Bach introduced me to him, and he would, I would have shows at, um, what's his name? Harris Jazz Cultural Theater. What's his name? Harris um, had a jazz cultural yeah. theater. Yeah. Barry, Barry yeah. Harris. And I would have uh, jazz shows there and the tap dances. And Gene, it was old W place, but Gene would come there. And that wonderful lady that um, that helped Charlie Parker, she would always be there. What was her name? Yeah. The, what was her name? The uh, yeah, Baroness. The, yeah, Baroness. Baroness. With the she, Rolls Royce. Yeah, she, I think Barry, <laughs> Barry and Thelonious was living there at the time. Right. And so she would always come there because she mm. told me, she said, I'm telling you, Leonard Feather's a drag. She talked like him. That's a that's a Jane Bach talk. I'm gonna cut you loose. You know they talk like the jazz musician, huh? No, that's like the jazz lingo. Roy Eldridge and them talk like that. Did you do something with the Hines brothers? Or the Hines family? The Hines. Do you do with the Hines brothers? No. They have a play now, um, Earth, Wind, and Fire, a musical mm, on Broadway. Feet. Hot feet. It's called Hot Feet. Hot feet. Yeah. Oh, okay. yeah. Yeah. Hot feet. But he's not in it. He's, he's a choreograph, yeah. I mean, the family. Do Folks, you know, we've come to the point of the presentation. Uh, and, and again, this is just another one of these events where I feel like, like we'd sit for about six hours. Mm -hmm. And it, it would just go by just like this. And, and, and we're going uh, to, A, we're going to open it up to the audience for any questions and or comments that you'd like to make to and or about Delilah and all the different things we've been talking about. And, uh, and I'll, I just want to say this once again, uh, how happy we are to have so many uh, of our uh, Harlem Speaks guests here tonight. And also just with this group of people here, and especially with someone who we'd love to have, you know, one of the giants of, of the stage, you know, of Stump and Stumpy right here, um, who could add also so much because he, this is, you know, we're talking about famous people in show business and all these acts. This gentleman right here is in the pantheon of, of the all-time great Can I say something? When he was 12 years old, at the parlor, then they had um, beautiful skits. And him and Maurice Ellis did this skit called There's Gold in Them There Hills. And he would do these skits. And they would wait for him to come from school. And then they would hire him. But I hope he'd be at Harlem Speak, so I'm not going to tell the story. Well, very know. soon. But okay. we got to get this panel thing going. That <laughs> okay. first. So before we do that, uh, any questions from the audience for our guest, please, folks? Speak now or forever hold your peace. I mean. That time, funny, but it mean it like that. <laughs> <laughs> anyway, but I mean it though. <coughs> no? Wow, this is, uh, this, is, this is absolutely, this is wonderful. We, let me tell you about what's coming up be before we, we uh, wrap up here, uh, about what's coming up in the next couple of weeks. Uh, May 18th, uh, we're doing a tribute to Ella Fitzgerald. Mm. And for the first time, we're going to have a concert because I, I don't want to pat myself on the back, but one thing that we don't do here is we don't ask musicians to play for free. Because as a musician myself, so many organizations that purport to love us so much, uh, what they usually wind up doing at the end of it is, oh, by the way, bring your horn and play, all this kind of stuff. So, and I say, you know, you don't ask a doctor at a party, excuse me, would you take my pulse? You know, <laughs> just hope he's not a proctologist. But seriously, but, but, but these things happen. And, and, and you know, basically, uh, so we got some funding to pay the musicians to do some stuff. So on May 18th, we're doing a tribute to Ella Fitzgerald, and mm. I had done a concert down at the Smithsonian about a month ago with a wonderful singer from Washington whose name is Dolores King Williams. And so we're going to bring her up with a band from New York and do this tribute to Ella Fitzgerald. It's going to be on May 18th. It's mm. free. And it's, we're not going to have it here because there's no piano here. We're going to do it up at 126th and uh, Fifth Avenue, a place called Nubian Heritage, mm -hmm. Boma. It's a really wonderful place. This is 126. That's right. So that's what I was just saying. We're going to do it at 106 and 5th Avenue. And it's called Nubian Heritage. And so that's May 18th. It's going to be free, so mark your calendars. The week after that, May, 20, uh, May 25th, we're having Arthur Barnes. And you may not know that name. Some of you know Arthur Barnes. Arthur Barnes is a guy who, like some of our other guests here that we've had, is not a musician, but somebody who did very well in the business world and grew up with Charlie Rangel and a whole bunch of folks and has done so much for jazz. He works for a big insurance company called HIP. 
and all the good things that they have done for jazz over the years. He's given away more money from the corporate world towards jazz that you could shake a stick at, if that's your idea of a good time. So he's going to be here on May 25th, and we're going to interview him. Then coming up in June, on June, oh man, I think it's the 8th, I don't have my calendar in front of me, but the first, I guess it will be the second Tuesday, the Thursday in June, we're going to have a very interesting guitarist, cornetist, composer who's from a different era of jazz by the name of Olu Dara. And if you don't know about Olu Dara, you got to know about Olu Dara because he's a fascinating guy. And then coming up later in June, I think on the 29th, um, oh, my old piano teacher, a very obscure musician, but I'd like you to come here by the way. His name is Hank Jones. Oh, I love him. So, right. Did you so have him talking Jones. already? Well, I don't know. You have, no, we're, we're going to have him in June. Because he can I, talk. June. And then uh, and we've got just a whole bunch of great stuff coming up after Thank that. So I just want to throw there's some upcoming announcements. And Delilah, I just want to say that one of the things that motivates us, this sounds glib, but I don't mean it to sound glib, to actually build a museum is, you know, I would hope that, you know, if you agreed and with, your, and, 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 and with Kobe and all the wonderful things that you do at Kobe's place, you know, that I can't think of a better place than a jazz museum in Harlem, you know, for there to be a curator of, of all things Delilah. <laughs> and it's like, you seem to have the answers to this, to like this scattered crossword jigsaw puzzle, this, the, this, this world, and you're the person who knows how to put the pieces together. Mm, I hope and so. so, you know, we want to open this place and we want you to, to be part of it to the extent that you can and, uh, you know, be our curator and, oh, and, and, and do all these things. Delilah Jackson, ladies and gentlemen. Thank you. We'd like to present you. Oh my God! We kind of did this. We we took the picture before because Greg Thomas had had another engagement, so we just wanted to take a look. We'll officially present you with our with our Harlem Speaks plaque, which is a lovely thing. And again, folks, we'll see you back here on May 18th up at Boma for the Elephant's Jail tribute. Once again, Delilah Jackson. Thank, Thank you, you so much. Thank you.